Hi, I'm Mark Elliott. I teach um, public law in the law faculty at Cambridge. And I'm going to talk to you today about uh, constitutional law. So constitutional law is one of the subjects that you would uh, do in your uh, first year at Cambridge. Um, and indeed, it's, it's a subject that, that, that most universities teach to their um, first year law students. Now, when we think of a constitution, we might immediately think of a country like um, America, where there's a, a document called the constitution. And of course, in the UK, we don't have anything like that. And that uh, leads some people to, to wonder uh, whether or not we have a constitution in the UK. And that's really the question that I want to explore today. Do we have a constitution in Britain? And if we do, and I'll try to show you that we, we do, what kind of constitution is it? And importantly, how is it different from the kinds of things that we might think about when we think about a constitution? So to begin with, um, let's think about uh, what constitutions actually do. Now, there are many different jobs that a constitution uh, does, and there are many different things that we might want um, a constitution to do. But essentially, what they do is to lay down the ground rules for how a country works. The constitution provides an opportunity for the people of a country, at least in a democracy, to say, OK, here is how we want to be governed. Here's how we want to organise our society, our system of government and our system of law. In doing that, a constitution will generally allocate power. It will set up a legislature to make the law. It will set up a government to run the country, a system of court to adjudicate on legal disputes. And the constitution will give authority to those different institutions. And in general, it will also limit their authority. It will uh, allow them to do certain things, but it will draw certain lines and it will stop them from interfering, for example, uh, in certain aspects of people's lives. We would also expect a constitution to tell us something about the basic values of the society concerned. We might, for example, look to see whether the constitution has things to say about democracy and the rule of law. If it does, that will be telling. And equally, if it doesn't, that will be telling. Of course, there might be all kinds of things about democracy and the rule of law and so on in a constitution. And the lived reality of people in that country might be different. But if a society uh, intends to base itself on these values, then at least as a starting point, we would expect to see them reflected in the constitution. We might also expect, at least in most countries, to see fundamental rights reflected in the constitution. I mentioned earlier that constitutions allocate and limit state power. One of the ways in which many constitutions limit the power of the state is by saying that there are certain fundamental rights that the state isn't allowed to interfere with. Certain laws, for example, that the government or the parliament cannot make lawfully, uh, because to do so would be to interfere with the fundamental rights of citizens. Now, when we look at a country like the uh, US, uh, we do in fact find uh, that uh, we have a constitution that, that does these things. First and foremost, we have a text, something we can actually physically see or get hold of, a written constitutional document that sets out those ground rules that create the institutions of government and that confers power on them and limits their powers. The US Constitution also affords protection to fundamental rights because contained within the Constitution is a Bill of Rights that sets out the basic rights of the individuals and which prevents the states, including lawmakers, from interfering with those rights. If that happens, the matter can be taken to court and ultimately laws can be struck down if they breach uh, fundamental rights as set out in the constitution. 
In the slide, you'll see that I've referred to the Bill of Rights as an entrenched Bill of Rights. And what I mean by that is that it's something that can't easily be taken away or diluted or interfered with because it is part of the Constitution. And generally speaking, we would expect constitutions to be relatively difficult to change. You might need to have a special majority. You might need to have the support of the public. It would depend on the particular country concerned. But generally speaking, we expect the constitution to have a special higher legal status. That means that it is more difficult to alter it than it is to make or to change regular laws. And that marks the constitution out as special. And it means that the constitution can operate to actually um, sort of lay down values, principles, ways of doing things, which are there for the long term and that can't just be got rid of just because a particular government, for example, doesn't entirely agree with them. So what about the UK? Well, here we find quite a different picture. To start with, there's no written constitution. That doesn't, as we'll see, mean that there's no constitution at all, but it does mean that it's a very different kind of constitution. Something else that differentiates the UK system from that of a system like America is the idea of parliamentary sovereignty. I'll say a bit more about that later, but essentially it means that our lawmakers in parliament can do whatever they want. There are no constitution limits on the laws that they can enact. Alongside that, there are other unusual features of the British constitution. For example, I mentioned a minute ago that in the US, it's quite hard to change the constitution because it isn't ordinary law, it's a special kind of law to which a special and quite difficult to comply with procedure applies should somebody want to amend it. In contrast, in the UK, Constitutional law, at least technically, is just ordinary law. It doesn't have a different legal status from, say, criminal law or contract law or commercial law. And from that, it also follows that our constitution can't provide the kind of entrenched Bill of Rights, the kind of protection for fundamental rights that we would find in a system like the US system. Because there's no written constitution, because Parliament is sovereign and can do what it wants, because all constitutional law is actually just ordinary law, even if we had a Bill of Rights, and we do have a kind of Bill of Rights in the Human Rights Act, it would only, and the Human Rights Act is, only a regular law. And that means that technically at least it can be changed just as easily as any other law. So at least on the surface, the UK constitution looks very different from that of a country like the US. And if we go back to the things that we said we would expect a constitution to do, things like limiting the power of the state, entrenching fundamental rights, and elevating certain fundamental principles above ordinary law, we might then begin to ask ourselves, does the UK really have a constitution? Well, having set out that background, what I want to spend the rest of this talk doing is really asking whether, in spite of those sort of superficial differences, whether the UK really is so different. So I want to do that by asking, what does it really mean to have an unwritten constitution? Is Parliament's power really unlimited? Can the UK constitution not protect fundamental rights? And does constitutional law here not really have any kind of special status. What we'll see is that the answers to these questions are nuanced, and that while it certainly leaves us with the uh, impression and the accurate impression, I would say, that the British constitution is quite different from the constitutions of many other countries, the differences are not as great as they at first appear once we understand them. And they certainly aren't so great as to require us to conclude that the UK doesn't have a constitution. It does have a constitution. It's just rather an unusual one.
Now, just to take that idea a little bit further, I want to draw a distinction between what we might call hierarchical and flat constitutions. And this reflects a point that I made uh, a couple of minutes ago. If we think about a system like America, we would call that a hierarchical constitutional system. Right at the apex of that constitutional pyramid, if you like, is constitutional law. It's at the apex of the system. And essentially, everything else has to fit around that. If lawmakers try to make laws that are inconsistent with the constitution, whether that's because they breach the Bill of Rights, or because they're incompatible with some other aspect of the constitution. If lawmakers do that, then they act unlawfully. They exceed their constitutional powers and ultimately a court can step in and can correct that. It can strike down or quash the law which has been made in breach of the constitution. In contrast with the reasons that I've just mentioned, we might think of the UK system as a flat system. Rather than there being a pyramid with constitutional law at the top, we have a much sort of flatter structure whereby constitutional law simply sits alongside and in terms of its legal status is no different from and isn't superior to ordinary law, other kinds of law, like I said, criminal, commercial, contract, uh, whatever else, uh, what other, whatever other kinds of law we might choose to think of. And that makes a significant difference because a lot of the things that we expect constitutions to do, they do because constitutional law has this special status because it sits at the top of the pyramid, as it were. If that's not possible, if constitutional law doesn't have that special status, as it doesn't, uh, generally speaking, in the UK, then that means we've got to think again about how the constitution works. Another important part of the jigsaw when we're trying to understand how the British constitution works is this idea of parliamentary sovereignty. So writing over a hundred years ago, Professor um, Albert Van Dicey, who was a, a leading and very influential uh, writer on the British constitution, he defined parliamentary sovereignty uh, in this way. The sovereignty of Parliament, said Dicey, is from a legal point of view, the dominant characteristic of our political institutions. The principle of parliamentary sovereignty means neither more nor less than this, that Parliament has the right to make or unmake any law whatever, and that no person or body is recognized by the law of England as having the right to override or set aside the legislation of Parliament. So let's just pause and um, unpack this a little bit. What is Dicey telling us here about this idea of parliamentary sovereignty? Well, first, that it's important. It's the dominant characteristic, he says, of our political institutions. It's fundamental to understanding how our political and constitutional system actually works. What does it mean? Well, it means, he says, two things. And in a sense, these are two different sides of the one coin. First, it means that parliament can make or unmake any law, whatever. In other words, there are no legal limits on the laws that parliament can make. And then second, that no person or body can override or set aside an act of parliament. In other words, Parliament can do what it wants, that's the first point. And then second, the other side of the coin is that nobody can stop Parliament legally from doing what it wants. That's obviously a very different picture then from the one that I painted at the beginning, both in terms of what we would expect constitutions to do. We said that we would expect them to limit the power of uh, the state and yet here, we seem to have an institution of the state, Parliament, which has the job of making law, that has unlimited power. And it's also a very different picture from the one that I drew of the American Constitution, where the Constitution sits at the apex of the system and the laws made by Congress have got to fit around it. And if 
the laws breach the constitution, then the laws are invalid. This seems to give Parliament a completely blank page. It seems to give Parliament the ability to do whatever it wants, including, presumably, um, going against fundamental values like democracy or the rule of law itself, and also interfering with taking away fundamental human rights. So is this idea of parliamentary sovereignty, of one part of the state that seems to be entirely uncontrolled legally and uncontrollable legally, is that consistent with the idea of really having a constitution that does the kinds of things we said constitutions do, limiting power, protecting rights, entrenching fundamental values? Well, let's, let's see. So far, we've been focusing on the law um, and on the idea that, as Dicey put it, uh, nobody has the legal right to override or set aside an act of parliament. But of course, that's only part of the picture. Because in the first place, parliament is a political institution. In order for a law to be made, it has to command the support of a majority in the House of Commons, and usually a majority in the House of Lords. And so if we try to work out why uh, there aren't, um, you know, lots and lots of laws in this country uh, that um, interfere with basic rights and basic constitutional principles, then part of the answer, one would hope, is that the people who sit in Parliament, the MPs and the peers, uh, don't actually uh, want to make laws of that nature and know that if they tried to, they would face a very significant uh, public and political backlash. So one of the reasons why constitutional values and basic rights are upheld is not so much because the law says they've got to be, but because we would hope that our political system delivers lawmakers and a political environment where it isn't uh, an easy or attractive thing to do to make laws that contravene those sorts of principles and values. To look a little bit more carefully at this idea of how politics can operate as a constraint and as something that upholds constitutional values and principles, I want to look uh, briefly at how uh, the Scottish uh, Parliament works in relation to devolution. So just over 20 years ago now, um, the Scottish Parliament was created and devolution was introduced, which gives uh, Scotland a degree of self-government. So the Scottish Parliament can make laws for Scotland and the Scottish government can govern Scotland within those areas that have been devolved. More recently, the Scotland Act was um, amended and um, certain provisions were inserted to emphasize the constitutional importance of devolution. In particular, in section 63A1 of the Scotland Act, we're told that the Scottish Parliament and the Scottish Government are permanent parts of the UK's constitutional arrangements. The Act goes on to say that the Scottish Parliament can make laws to be known as Act of the Scottish Parliament, but that this section doesn't affect the power of the UK Parliament to make laws for Scotland. What is this telling us about the Scottish Parliament and about its place within the British Constitution? It seems to be sort of speaking with a forked tongue. It's saying that on the one hand, there is a Scottish Parliament and it can make laws for Scotland and those laws are called Acts of the Scottish Parliament and that is emphasising the, uh, the significance of the Scottish Parliament's authority, that it has a very substantial lawmaking authority uh, within the scope of devolution. We're also told that the Scottish Parliament and government are permanent parts of the UK's constitutional arrangements. Does that mean that 
that the UK Parliament then, which is supposedly sovereign, that it can't get rid of any of these arrangements. Well, if we look at section 28.7, at the bottom of the slide, the answer seems to be that actually the UK Parliament can still do what it wants. It says that this section does not affect the power of the Parliament of the UK to make laws for Scotland. What this means then is that in the Scotland Act, we have a system whereby the UK Parliament, the sovereign Parliament, has established devolution, it's established a government and a legislature in Scotland. It's given it very significant powers. It said that it's permanent, that these arrangements are permanent. But at the end of the day, the UK Parliament hasn't actually, as a matter of law, given away any of its powers. This point was made by the Supreme Court in what's called the Continuity Bill case. I needn't go into the, uh, the details of that case. I just want to um, mention this particular passage from the, the judgment. In this uh, case, the Supreme Court said that um, section 28.7 of the Scotland Act, so the last bit that we just looked at, makes it clear that even though um, legislative authority is given to the Scottish Parliament, the UK Parliament remains sovereign and its power in relation to Scotland is undiminished. This, said the Supreme Court, reflects the essence of devolution, a system that preserves the powers of the central legislature of the state in relation to all matters. So looked at in this way, what the UK Parliament has done is to share or lend some of its power to the Scottish Parliament, but it hasn't relinquished any of its power. As a matter of law, therefore, the UK Parliament could, if it wanted to, uh, cut down devolution, or even, ultimately, it could abolish devolution. Of course, it wouldn't do this, and it would be essentially impossible for it to do this, because it would be politically impossible. It would be politically unthinkable for that to happen. But the point is that ultimately, what stops something like that from happening is not that the UK Parliament is legally unable to do it, legally it is able to do it, but rather, political factors come into play and prevent it from happening. So can the UK Parliament do anything it wants? Well, as a matter of law, parliamentary sovereignty suggests that it can. But as a matter of political reality, no, it can't. The Scottish example is just one. There are other things we might think of where even though theoretically it would be possible to pass a particular law and to take away or to interfere with fundamental rights or other constitutional values such as democracy or the rule of law, even though those things would be legally possible, we know that politically it would be impossible. And that's one of the defining features of the British system, that we tend to be more willing in the UK to live with the possibility that things are legally doable, but that we can rely on politics and the political process to stop certain really bad things from happening. But where does that leave us in terms of the law? Are we saying that, that the only reason why these sort of unconstitutional, as it were, things don't happen is because political pressure prevents them from happening? Does the law not really have any role to play in this area? Well, in fact, it does. And I want to illustrate that point um, as I uh, come towards the end of this talk by uh, looking at some uh, case law. Um, I want to start by looking at the Privacy International case. In this case, there was a piece of legislation called the Intelligence Services Act 1994. And this gave government ministers 
the power to authorize certain kinds of computer hacking for intelligence purposes. And a dispute had arisen about exactly how broad those powers were. The claimant argued that the powers were narrower and the government argued that they were broader. The, the details of the disagreement don't really matter for present purposes. The important point is that when this issue went to uh, a body called the Investigatory Powers Tribunal, which is effectively a, a kind of court, the tribunal agreed with the minister. So it sided with the minister and it said, yes, the powers are on the broader side. We agree with the minister's sort of view of how wide the powers are. Now the claimant, which wanted to argue that the powers were actually uh, properly understood narrower than that, it wanted to challenge the tribunal's decision. However, section 67.8 of the uh, act said that determinations and other decisions of the tribunal shall not be subject to appeal or liable to be questioned in any court. Did that mean that there was no possibility of the tribunal's decision being questioned by the claimants? You might think, well, of course, it does mean that because that's, that's what it says. Um, and surely if that's what the Act says, and if Parliament is sovereign, then everybody has to um, respect that. The difficulty, or a difficulty, is that a provision like that, that is essentially saying, here is something that the courts cannot look at. Here is a matter which remove, is entirely removed from being considered by courts of law. Provisions like that in legislations are regarded as an affront to the rule of law. The rule of law is a basic constitutional value and it, it's multifaceted. It means a number of different things. And there is at the margins, at least, there's quite a lot of debate and disagreements about exactly what it does mean. But fundamentally, the rule of law means that government must be subject to the law. It means that the meaning of the law must be determinable by independent courts. And it means that independent courts must be able to adjudicate on legal disputes, such as disputes about the, the breadth of a minister's power to authorize uh, computer hacking. So in this case, the Supreme Court was ultimately faced with a question about both the meaning of the legislation, did it really get rid of all judicial oversight of this matter? And that led on really to a broader question still, which is, can Parliament do that? Can Parliament really legislate to remove a legal question such as this one about the scope of a government minister's power? Can it really legislate to remove questions like that from judicial determination, given that to remove questions like that from judicial determination would seem to be a basic breach of the rule of law, which itself is a fundamental constitutional principle. Well, the Supreme Court said that the case essentially turned on a question of interpretation. If we look again at section 67, subsection 8 of the Act, it says that determinations and other decisions of the tribunal shall not be subject to appeal or be liable to be questioned in any court. So the Supreme Court said we have to decide what that actually means. Now, whenever the court interprets a provision in a piece of legislation, or at least whenever it's relevant, the court will apply something called the principle of legality. And the principle of legality says that courts, as far as they possibly can, will always interpret legislation compatibly with fundamental constitutional principles. How does that work here? Well, if we gave section 67.8 of this act its sort of natural meaning, I guess we would say it means what it says on the tin. It means that courts just can't get involved. 
The difficulty is that that sort of natural or plain words interpretation of section 67 8 would be inconsistent with the rule of law because it would be shielding the decision of a government minister from judicial scrutiny. And so the court has to ask itself, is there some other way that we can interpret this provision in a way that will protect the rule of law, at least to some extent? And the Supreme Court decided that there was. It held that section 67 only protected legally valid determinations and decisions from judicial scrutiny. So that if the minister had made a legal error in terms, for example, of understanding the scope of her powers, then the court would be able to intervene. Now that might suggest that the court is really rather stretching things. Is that really what parliament meant? Didn't parliament really mean to keep the courts out? And if that is what we think, if we think that that's really what parliament meant, then what's really going on here? Is the court actually telling us that um, parliament isn't really allowed to do this kind of thing at all? And if that's what the court is saying, does that mean it's telling us that parliament isn't really sovereign? Well, some of the judges in the Privacy International case did engage, at least to some extent, with these really fundamental questions. Lord Sumption was clear. He said that parliamentary sovereignty is a fundamental principle of the British constitution, and that therefore judicial scrutiny of matters can be excluded as long as parliament legislates clearly enough. So as long as parliament makes its intention absolutely clear, in other words, if it leaves no room for interpretive argument, then Lord Sumption says, parliament must be allowed to have its way because it's sovereign. And at the end of the day, whatever it says has to be done. Lord Carnworth, one of the other judges in this case, however, was more circumspect. He said that parliament can't impose limits on a body's power and then authorize that body to ignore them because that would be to make a mockery of the imposition of the limits in the first place. And then he goes further, he says that it's ultimately for the courts, not the legislature, to determine the limits set by the rule of law to the power of excluding judicial review or judicial scrutiny. Now in that final comment there, Lord Carnworth is arguably calling into question to some extent, the very idea of parliamentary sovereignty. He's saying it's ultimately for the courts, not parliament, to decide what the rule of law requires. The implication being that if parliament gets it wrong and makes a law which is incompatible with the rule of law, it would be open to a court on this view to tell parliament that it had overstepped the mark. Now it may seem odd that parliament, that, that the court, rather, it may seem odd that the courts um, have these sorts of disagreements. We can see from uh, the judgments there of Lord Sumption and Lord Carnworth that they're not exactly in full agreement with each other. And that suggests that there is a, a basic sort of ambiguity at the heart of the British constitution. Some things are clear, but some things aren't clear. Two things that are clear is that, first of all, the political process provides a degree of protection for fundamental constitutional values. Politics itself and the values that are sort of embedded in our political system provide a degree of security for constitutional standards. Hence, the fact that the Westminster Parliament would not seek to abolish the Scottish Parliament, notwithstanding that it legally has the power to do so. The other thing that's clear, as we've seen from the Privacy International case, and there are many other examples of this, is that there's a good deal that courts can do by interpreting uh, legislation, that legislation that on its face might seem to threaten constitutional values might be made consistent with them through interpretation. And as we've seen 
uh, in the Privacy International case, that interpretation can be quite um, a bold and creative one. But what's less clear, and that's what we see in the, the debate between Lord Sumption and Lord Carnworth in the Privacy case, what's less clear is whether courts can go further. If Parliament unambiguously undermines a basic constitutional principle, such as a fundamental right or the rule of law or something of that nature, if Parliament legislates in a way that it is so clearly inconsistent with something like that, that there's no room for interpretation, and clearly if that happens, politics has failed to provide protection, can the courts go further? Can they step in and say to Parliament, you've gone too far, I'm sorry, but the constitution, the law, doesn't allow you to do that? Well, that brings us back full circle to a question that we started with about what the constitutions do and how do they work? Do, does the British constitution deny parliament the power to do things of this nature? Or is it really sovereign in the fullest sense of that term? The answer that the Privacy International case gives, if we put together the different judgments of Lord Sumption and Lord Carnworth, is that we aren't sure. It's certainly the case that as a matter of orthodox teaching, Parliament is sovereign. But it's also the case that we have judgments like Lord Carnworth's, where we're told that actually it's for the courts to decide what the rule of law requires and whether or not Parliament can um, do something which infringes the rule of law. That seems like a very basic question not to have a clear answer to. In many other systems, like the American system, the answer to that question was clarified right at the beginning of, of its constitutional um, sort of journey. Uh, in in the, uh, the case of Marbury and Medicine, um, around 200 years ago, the US Supreme Court decided um, that the uh, US constitution did prevent certain laws from being made and that the courts could step in and, and, and correct matters if unconstitutional laws were made. Why do we not know the answer to that question in relation to the British Constitution? And the answer, I think, is that this is not a, a, an accidental ambiguity, it's a constructive ambiguity. If the courts were really to go as far as Lord Carnworth hints, if the courts were really to step in and tell Parliament that it had gone too far, there's a good chance that that would provoke a constitutional crisis. And it's certainly the case that we don't know what would happen next. We would be in, in uncharted territory. But by making statements of the type that Lord Khan was made, the courts are projecting a kind of soft power. They're saying to parliaments, you know, don't, don't go there. You know, there are certain things that you know you shouldn't do and that we know that you shouldn't do. No one can be certain what would happen if those things actually occurred, if Parliament made laws of that nature. But the courts are certainly firing a warning shot across Parliament's bounds. And I think that in a system like the British one, where there's no written constitution, there aren't any uh, sort of preordained answers to questions like this. That's perhaps the best that we can hope for, that there is this kind of creative tension between Parliament and the courts. And the courts fire the occasional warning shot. Parliament um, generally stays on the right side of the line and we kind of muddle through. And that muddling through, or if you want to put it more positively, that sort of mutual respect or mutual fear that the different parts of the constitution have for each other, that is a large part of how the constitution works. So what is it that protects fundamental values? Well, politics, judicial interpretation, but also this complicated relationship that we see between the different parts of the constitution, where the very uncertainty about what might happen if somebody goes too far tends on the whole to stop 
people, whether that's lawmakers or indeed judges, from going too far. So does the UK have a constitution? Well, yes, it certainly does have a constitution, as we've seen uh, in what we've been talking about today. But it's a very unusual kind of constitution. It isn't written down in the way that so the American constitution is. It doesn't unambiguously limit the powers of the state in the way that a constitution uh, tends to do. And it doesn't straightforwardly place things like fundamental rights beyond any kind of legal interference. But at the same time, it does do many of the things that we would expect constitutions to do, albeit in rather different, more roundabout, and sometimes more subtle um, ways. And actually, I think that it is in that complexity and it's in that subtlety and sometimes the uncertainty that we find some of the interest of studying the British constitution. So if you, uh, if you come to Cambridge or if you uh, go to university, uh, and you study constitutional law, uh, you certainly won't find that there are easy or neat answers to the questions that you'll be uh, looking at. Uh, but I think that you will find um, that there are really interesting questions to consider uh, and uh, really uh, rich uh, questions to, uh, to explore. Well, I hope that's whetted your appetite for constitutional law. Um, uh, and I hope that you enjoy uh, the rest of the, the Cambridge Law Sixth Form Law Conference. It's been uh, a pleasure to, to talk to you today. I'm sorry that we can't do this um, in person, uh, but I hope that you've enjoyed it. Um, and I wish you all the best with the rest of the, the conference. Thank you.